The world has changed a lot since you first uh, wrote Raising Boys in 1997 and the role of masculinity is changing. Do, do you see the same principles applying now or is there a whole different set of issues that boys have got to deal with in 2021? Well, once long ago, I was in a room with 200 women. I was, felt like having a bit of fun and I said, um, design a perfect man for me. What would he look like? What would he be like? And when we boiled it down, it all came down to two things. And that was backbone and heart. And what they meant by backbone was being trustworthy, being reliable. They wanted someone they could count on. And then the other was heart. So they are also saying we want tenderness and kindness and someone you can feel close to and the kids can feel close to. And so it's as simple as that. And I think that's been this, the case for millions of years. That's what, what masculinity is supposed to be about. Steve, is there one crucial thing that we miss in raising boys? I think there has been for about 100 years because of wars and because of terrible... You know, the 20th century was terrible. Men either weren't around or they were emotionally knocked out of action by trauma, so they were very shut down. And so getting men to be around boys and also to be more open-hearted with them is the secret. And this is why your generation of dads are so much better because we've come out of that nightmare and we know dads can be around little children. We can push strollers. We can go to the park. That actually didn't happen in my dad's generation. So um, having men in boys' lives makes all the difference. Is there, is there a, a mistake that you see, you know, that parents tend to make, particularly around raising boys? I think there's a danger in raising boys, but also, in fact, all children. And what it is, is having a fixed idea of what your child is supposed to be like or what they're supposed to turn out like. For instance, um, high testosterone boys have trouble with reading. And so you have to work to help them to be able to, to use words and talk and, and spend more time helping them to be a communicator. But you might have a boy who's very gentle and, and he might need a bit of help to stick his jaw out and use a loud voice sometimes. But at the same time, that's another way to be male. And if you have a parent who thinks there's only one way to be male, which they used to often do, that's a problem. So regard each child as a unique person that you have to get to know and then they'll feel like they're, that they're interesting and worthwhile to you, whoever they are, and that'll make it all the difference. Steve, one of the ideas that's really resonated with me is the idea of outside role models for our kids. What do you think about that? Yes, one of the most practical things you can do if you've got a mid-teen child, boy or girl, but especially, I think, with boys, is at about 14, boys have this thing that they just don't want to be like dad. And um, they love you, but they just think you're terrible. And <laughs> But they still need role models. So, you know, go away with a bunch of guys and their sons. And your son will end up talking to someone else's dad, you know, one of your mates or, yeah. or his uncle or someone, and get some really good guidance or affirmation. And, and he'll start to start to put put together his his manhood by borrowing from all the best men that he knows. And so by having, you know, artistic men, sporting men, and really kind of scientific men, and men who are gentle, and men who are gay, and, and every possible, different races, every possibility, then your son can, can think, I, I like that about him, and I like that about him. I wanted to ask you about the world now of the iPhone, social media, that our kids grow up in. It's, it's something as parents we're all, we're all navigating with, uh, with some challenge. How do you view that world? Social media, Luke, is especially toxic for girls. Now, the reason for this is that girls are wired up somewhat differently to be much more aware of social cues and of noticing people's feelings around them. And that's a really good quality. But it was designed for when we were a hunter-gatherer and we lived in a little clan of 20 people. And what social media does is it brings several thousand uncaring strangers into your, sometimes into your bedroom, and so it sets off, you know, the, that wonderful radar that, that girls are programmed with and to absolute alarm. And it's just a terrible sort of toxic overload. There's a very simple step which 
people on my Facebook community have all been doing in the last couple of years now, which is at the start of tea time, at the start of dinner time, everyone puts everything on a charger in the kitchen. Nobody goes near them for the rest of the night. That's mum and dad too, which is tough. What people who do that say is their daughter has a good night's sleep for the first time in months. She's cheerful in the morning. She's keen to go to school instead of scared to go to school. And so we've provided a, a haven. You know, when we were kids, home was a haven from, from our friends and, and the rough and tough and horribleness sometimes of the playground. And so we've got to put that back. What would you describe uh, as the key to, to a happy family? That's easy and it's time. And there's a, there's a thing that if I could write it on the sky, you know, if I could hire one of those planes and write it on the sky, it would be that hurry is the enemy of love. And that of course we love each other in the family, but when we're rushed, we'd lose it. And so if you can slow down anything at all in your life, it will improve the love in your family and things will go better. We couldn't finish on a better note than that.